Today we'll be dealing with two topics. In the first section, you'll be shown the circuit. In the second part, you'll be told how to cope with illusions that can be created by different flight conditions. The first section will show you how to fly a circuit pattern and how to leave and enter the circuit. The circuit is the specified paths to be flown by aircraft operating in the vicinity of an airport. The prime purpose of the circuit is safety. The circuit is rectangular in shape and has five arbitrarily defined legs. There is the climb after takeoff leg, the crosswind leg, which is not to be confused with circuit joining crosswind, which you'll be told about later. 90 degrees to the crosswind leg is the downwind leg. Another 90 degree turn puts you on the base leg. Lastly, there's the final approach leg. All circuits run counterclockwise unless special conditions exist and there is authorized advice to the contrary. As well, unless you are told otherwise, all normal circuits are 1,000 feet above ground level. Let's start at the beginning. After takeoff, there is a straight climb into the wind, normally to 500 feet. Then there is a 90 degree turn onto the crosswind leg where the aircraft climbs to circuit height and levels off. Another 90 degree turn brings the aircraft onto the downwind leg which runs parallel to the landing path. On this leg you would do any pre-landing checks. From here you make a 90 degree turn onto the base leg. The last 90 degree turn puts you on the final leg. The aircraft is kept straight until the landing is completed. The heading you will steer on the crosswind and base legs will be determined by the strength of the wind. When flying the circuit, keep a good lookout on both sides as well as above and below. At controlled airports, it's customary to omit the word leg when referring to circuit components. A typical radio transmission would be... Still on the subject of radio communication, if you're at an unfamiliar airport, you might be asked to report over a point unknown to you. An example would be the Sherwood Park Freeway, a landmark known to local pilots flying out of the Edmonton Municipal. If you're unfamiliar with the local area, advise air traffic control immediately. When flying the circuit, it is crucial that you judge the whole pattern in relation to the runway, not to other points on the ground. This will help you judge the type of landing approach you should make. The latter part of the circuit is usually called the approach. Exactly where you will turn from downwind to base will depend upon the wind. The stronger the wind, the steeper your angle of descent will have to be during the final straight approach. Therefore, you will have to make the turn to base sooner. Once you are flying base, adjust your heading to compensate for drift, then decide where to begin your descent. After descent has begun, you will have other decisions to make about the use of flaps and power to fine-tune your approach. This will be dealt with in another tape on approach and landing. Spacing of aircraft in the circuit is something you must be aware of as well. You must always be aware of your position in relation to other aircraft. An unforgivable sin is to cut off a preceding aircraft by turning base or final out of sequence. Tailgating or following too close may mean you will have to abort your approach and go around again before you can land. On the other hand, at a busy airport, you don't want to tie up traffic by allowing too much space between yourself and the preceding aircraft. Correct spacing comes with experience. You will have to account for wind and the circuit speeds of other aircraft. Your spot in the queue may be adjusted by widening or narrowing your circuit and increasing or decreasing your airspeed. You'll now be shown the correct procedures for leaving and joining the circuit at controlled airports. Later, we'll deal with uncontrolled fields. A control zone is the controlled airspace of a defined dimension. It extends upward from the ground to a specified height. The designation positive control zone means special regulations apply within the zone. For all practical purposes, civil airports with control towers may be considered positive control zones. After takeoff, if you fly outside of the circuit, you either remain in the control zone or leave it altogether. If you remain in the control zone, the tower will ask you to stay on the tower frequency and to advise what type of exercise you plan to do. The tower will also want to know what altitude you'll be flying at and where the exercise will be carried out. 
If you plan to leave the control zone, you will need permission from the tower to quit monitoring its frequency. When leaving a circuit with a left-hand traffic pattern, you must have permission from the tower to make a right-hand turn. If this permission cannot be granted, continue on the runway heading until you're clear of the traffic pattern and above circuit height before turning right. Keep in mind that as you leave the circuit, you may find yourself in the control zone of another airport you do not intend to land at. Remember, you must establish radio communication with the tower in the second control zone. You will remain under the control of this second airport until you're clear of the control zone again. Now we'll deal with returning to the circuit at a controlled airport. First, advise the control tower of your identification, direction and distance from the airport, as well as altitude and or request. This should be done prior to entering the control zone. When given clearance by the tower, you're expected to join the circuit downwind at circuit height, which you recall is 1,000 feet. The cleared to circuit instruction from the control tower allows you to make a right turn if you're joining crosswind, or it allows you to make a partial right turn downwind. You may also be given clearance to join the circuit on base or for a straight in approach, which means you would join it on final. At uncontrolled airports, you're more or less on your own. Some may have a Transport Canada flight service station or locally based aircraft operator with whom you must check in with. Although they have no control over aircraft, they can provide you with information on surface winds, runway conditions, ground traffic and weather. Make use of these services if they're available. Remember, you're also expected to transmit your intentions while in the circuit. And because you do not have the watchful eye of a control tower, be especially alert for other aircraft. If you want to leave the circuit at an uncontrolled field, continue climbing on the runway heading until you're well clear of the circuit. All turns in the vicinity of the airport should be to the left unless a right-hand circuit is designated. When returning to an uncontrolled field, take full advantage of any air-to-ground communications for landing advice. Ground conditions change in a short period of time. Should you plan to cross over the airport, do so well above circuit height. Then descend to circuit height on the upwind leg and enter the circuit crosswind. You may also enter the circuit downwind at circuit level where the downwind and crosswind legs intersect. Spacing yourself in the traffic is your responsibility. Normally there is only one runway at an uncontrolled field. However, the pilot makes the decision on which runway to use where more than one is available. Now, Take time for this quick review. While flying into the downwind leg of the circuit, you're cleared for landing. Is it mandatory for you to land on completing the circuit? While flying into the downwind leg of the circuit, you are cleared for landing. Is it mandatory for you to land on completing the circuit? The simple answer is yes. When joining the downwind leg of the circuit from the upwind side, you're required to cross the active runway at approximately midpoint at circuit height. Why must you be at circuit height? When joining the downwind leg of the circuit from the upwind side, you are required to cross the active runway at approximately midpoint at circuit height. Why must you be at circuit height? Air regulations state that you cannot descend into the circuit. The correct procedure is to cross over the runway well above the circuit to check the wind, then descend on the dead side to circuit height. Now cross over to join the downwind leg. In this section you will be shown how two types of illusions occur and how to avoid them. The first type are referred to as visual illusions and occur during an approach for landing. Illusions are frequently mentioned as contributing factors in approach and landing accidents. Research has determined that how you tend to see things is somewhat a matter of habit. That is, if you're accustomed to seeing runways of a similar width, a runway of a different width will appear the same. This is especially true if the proportions of that runway appear to be much the same early in the approach. If the unfamiliar runway is wider than normal, you may descend too low and crash if the error is not corrected in time. A wider runway will make you think you're higher than normal and you might stall out over the runway. Another illusion that might occur is caused by the slope of the runway. 
In mountainous country, this could range from three to six degrees. A small upslope gives you the illusion of being higher than you really are. Conversely, a downslope will deceive you into believing you are lower. Sloping problems are accentuated at night where the only visual references are the runway lights. To avoid problems with illusions at unfamiliar airports, note the runway size and surrounding terrain. Use any visual aids that might be available. The other type of illusions you may experience are those created by drift. They occur in strong winds when you're flying at a low altitude. This is something you would do during a forced landing approach when carrying out off-airport procedures or in deteriorating weather. At lower altitudes, movement relative to the ground becomes more apparent. In strong winds, illusions are created which, if misinterpreted, can develop into dangerous situations. The closer you are to the ground, the greater the deception. Because you're on the lookout for other aircraft and obstacles at these altitudes, there's little time to monitor the flight instruments. It is therefore important that you anticipate the false impressions that are created by the deceptive appearance of the ground. If visibility is good, you can fly low at normal cruising speed. However, in low visibility, it is recommended you reduce your speed. To maintain a lower speed, extend the flaps. This will allow you a tighter turning radius which you may need to avoid obstacles. And because you're using more power with the flaps extended, the extra slipstream over the elevators and rudders will give you greater control of the aircraft. Now, let's look at some of the illusions that you may be confronted with under different conditions. Remember, you're flying low with a strong wind. If you're flying into the wind, a reduced ground speed produces an illusion of a reduced airspeed. When you're flying downwind, the opposite occurs. The increased ground speed produces the illusion of increased airspeed. Resist the temptation to reduce your airspeed since, if carried to extremes, it could cause you to stall. If you're turning from upwind to downwind, it will appear that the aircraft is slipping inwards, even though you're performing an accurate and coordinated turn. This is an illusion created by drift over the ground. You can confirm this by glancing at the turn and ball indicator, which should have the ball centered. Do not use the rudder to attempt to correct what appears to be a slip. But because the drift is real, you must allow plenty of room to avoid any obstacle that might be inside the turn. In the opposite situation, when you are turning downwind to upwind, you will think the aircraft is skidding outwards. Again, confirm that your turn is accurate and coordinated by checking the instruments. Remember, the skid is an illusion, but you will have to compensate for the drift to avoid any obstacles outside of the turn. The illusory effect increases as the airspeed decreases and the wind velocity increases. Some precautions to take when flying low. One, look well ahead and maintain a safe airspeed. Two, turn accurately despite the deceptive illusions. Maintain coordinated flight. Three, keep a good lookout for other aircraft and obstacles and fly at a safe altitude and observe local regulations. Avoid annoying others and frightening livestock. Do not turn too steeply allow yourself sufficient space to maneuver and never practice this exercise unless there is an authorized flight instructor aboard. Now take time for this quick review. You are turning from upwind to downwind at a low level in a high wind. What illusion may appear and why is it dangerous? You are turning from upwind to downwind at a low level in a high wind. What illusion may appear and why is it dangerous? Under these conditions, it may appear that you are slipping inwards even though your turn is accurate. You must compensate for the drift, which is real. You must not use the rudder to compensate for the slip, which is an illusion. This situation can be dangerous if there's an obstacle inside the turn and you do not allow enough room to avoid it. You are flying downwind at a low level and in a strong wind. What illusion may be experienced and why could this be dangerous? You are flying downwind at a low level and in a strong wind. What illusion may be experienced 
and why could this be dangerous? You might notice an increase in airspeed, but this is an illusion. Therefore, do not reduce your airspeed because, if taken to extremes, this action could cause you to stall. Final question, you're turning from downwind into the wind. Why does the actual path of flight not follow the still air flight path? You are turning from downwind into the wind. Why does the actual path of flight not follow the still air flight path? The high wind causes the aircraft to drift outwards.